So I got an email the other day from an editor asking if I might review a paper because they use random forests. And apparently in psychology, I become the random forest guy. And I said, sure, why not? And I read through the paper and I saw this plot, an entire plot dedicated to showing variable importance for each of the variables that they had included. And I could not help but think, what? This same information would have been better presented in a table. <gasps> Wait a minute. Are you telling me the visualization guy is saying that information would be better conveyed in a table? Absolutely. Which is kind of funny because I'm always complaining about how there's not enough visuals in the scientific literature. And here I am actively discouraging an individual or individuals from uh, plotting a graph. But there's a reason for it. It actually reminds me when I was in graduate school, I read an article online, link in the description. And back at the time, like rating videos was really big on Netflix, like the five star rating sort of thing. And this article was saying that there are some users on Netflix that rate like 50,000 movies. Like, is it even possible to watch 50,000 movies in a lifetime? That's crazy. And they show this graph. And being the arrogant uh, graduate student that I was, I said, quote, I think your graph sucks. That was a tactful beginning, wasn't it? Most people know the difference between 20,000 and 50,000. They don't need a graph to point that out. <laughs> it's true. It would be more interesting to have the y-axis be the proportion of people and x-axis be the number of movies they have rated. I'm guessing it would look like a half pipe and be far more interesting. Wow, I didn't uh, hold back there. And then something else happened uh, this week. I was doing a consultation with somebody and they had decided to turn their uh, demographics table into a bunch of plots like a bar chart for males versus females and a histogram of ages and another bar chart of uh, ethnicities. And again, I found myself in the unusual position of saying, that's not necessary. You should not plot that information. And then I had this little moment of like, huh, there must be like a rule inside my head for when I include a plot in my final paper and when I don't. And I don't know what that is. So I did some exploration and I think I found out what it is. So without further ado, I think it is my personal duty to shed my infinite wisdom upon the masses and answer the following question. When should information be communicated in a plot versus in a table? Well, I think I have some answers for you. But first, let me make a uh, comment that may be a bit controversial. I like pineapple on my pizza. Pineapple and pepperoni, no less. Now, before you unsubscribe, let me move on. I have an opinion about writing papers. The purpose of writing a scientific paper is to argue a point. That's kind of controversial, because aren't we supposed to be like unbiased and that sort of thing? Yeah, pe we, 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 yeah, we pretend to be unbiased when we're writing papers, but we're really not. Really, what we're doing is we're trying to argue in favor of the evidence that we find. That's all science is. So we're less like a detective and more like an attorney. That there is my nod to Tukey. Love you, Tukey. Miss you, bro. So from the intro to the methods to the results to the discussion, what we are doing is we are building a story that supports the conclusions that we inevitably come to. So with that in mind, we don't want to include anything in our paper that detracts from our central message. And we also want to emphasize the things that support our main point. Now, also, I think it's important to make a distinction between plots for exploration versus plots for explanation. So when we're doing exploratory plots, these are plots just for the analyst, for me, when I'm doing data analysis. And these plots are used to figure out what is going on. What are my data trying to tell me? And so I might have plots with lowest lines to detect nonlinearities. Or I might have multi-paneled plots like this to detect interactions. And I might have diagnostic plots. I might have histograms and bar charts. And all these plots are used to teach me something about my data. But these plots aren't gonna make it into the paper, usually. And if they do make it to the paper, they're going to be relegated to the appendix. And so when you are using plots for exploration, the only rule is if it helps you understand what your data are trying to tell you, use it. If not, don't use it. 
But when we're talking about explanation, that's a totally different story. When we are using them for explanation, I call them model plots or plots that communicate our statistical model. So a model plot is a precise representation of the statistical model that we end up fitting. And so here's some examples. And these plots show the fit of the model with error. These are the summaries of your findings. And so as I'm going to mention my three rule, three rules. One, two, three, yep. As I'm going to mention my three rules, keep in mind these three rules are for the explanation plots or the plots that we actually include on our final paper. Rule number one, use plots to support your conclusions. Because here's the thing, when somebody reads your paper, they're probably gonna skim it. And anything that catches their eye, they're probably gonna focus on, which is probably gonna be your plots. So ask yourself, what do I want to draw attention to? Are you trying to draw attention to context? Like how many males versus females there are? Or what is the reliability of your measures? Or what is the distribution of your predictor variables? It's unwise to draw attention to context, unless that context is like super central to your main point, but it usually isn't. So if you're just talking about context, don't use a figure, use a table or even use the text. So instead, what you want to do is you want to draw attention to your conclusions, in which case, absolutely use a figure or a plot or a visualization. I use those terms interchangeably, by the way, and I actually alternate to avoid redundancy. Um, old writing trick, I suppose. So when you are drawing attention to conclusions, you want to use a figure and we use them strategically to communicate our main point. So here's a good um, rule of thumb or law to live by or words of wisdom from a plotting dude. Every plot in your analysis should advance the central claim of the paper. So don't include plots in the main body of your paper for like demographics or for diagnostic plots. If anything, those can be in the appendix but do include model plots. By the way, I've never heard anybody talk about model plots. I use the term model plots all the time. Model plots are just plots that communicate the final model that you arrived at. And most of the time it's some sort of scatter plot. So you can see the individual data points and it has some visual representation of what the model fits. That's what you want to include in your paper. Not these ancillary plots. Rule number two, patterns get pictures. Numbers get tables. So when you're trying to communicate something about the shape of something, use a plot. Like if you're trying to identify trends or curvature or interactions or clusters, heterogeneity, outliers, distributional form, if it's central to your message. And so if you're using the words in your text, like look at how this variable increases as this variable also increases. Or if you're talking about bends or seasonality or if you have plateaus or divergence or clusters or skewness. Again, if you use those words in the context of your central message, then yeah, include the plot in your paper. But if you're trying to communicate messages about a specific value, don't use a plot. And the reason why is because it's very hard to figure out what the precise value is of a number from a plot. Man, looks like it's about 57 to me. Yeah, don't do that. If you want to emphasize specific numbers, use a table. That's what tables are good at. That's like asking a monkey to swim or a dolphin to climb a tree. Doesn't make sense. So like examples where you might use a table is if you're talking about mean differences between groups or regression coefficients or effect sizes or demographic tables or cutoffs, those sorts of things belong in a table because you care about the specific values. And likewise, if you're only communicating information about like the order of variables or the exact values, use a table. So let's look at some examples. So here's the same data plotted versus in a table. Much better to see it in a table because it's communicating information about a trend. We care about the shape. That information would be very hard to glean from a table. Or here's another one. In this case, you're trying to look at evidence of an interaction effect. And if you just looked at the table, it would be very hard to tell if there's an interaction effect. But when you plot it, super easy to see. And if it's easy for you to see, it's going to be easy for your audience to see. And here's a plot that might not make it to the main body of the paper. So these are more plots for your own information. The two groups have identical means in the table, 
and similar standard deviations, but the shape of them is very, very different. So again, if you are trying to communicate information about shape or glean any information about shape from your data, use a plot. If you want to know precise values, use a table. And here's another example. If you're doing some sort of a cluster analysis, the table is a very, very poor representation of what is going on. You have to have a plot here. Now let's look at some examples where a plot is just a terrible idea. Like in this one. Okay, first of all, like, be extremely hesitant to use bar charts to communicate anything but counts. Like it's a terrible idea to use bar charts to communicate a mean. I hate these plots and I hope they die. There. Has my point come across clearly enough? So if you're trying to identify area under a curve, you might be able to say, okay, XG boost is a little higher than random forest, which is higher than the logistic regression. Yay but that information can be easily communicated in the table and much more concisely and much more informatively. Otherwise, you're squinting through your monocle to try to figure out what the precise value is. Just plot it in the table. Or here's another example. You got a heat map. So yay, there's blue. I like blue, but this isn't helpful. This is such a useless plot. It doesn't communicate any additional information. And if anything, it confuses things. So yeah, I can see that the color is also reflecting differences in the number, but the numbers do that themselves. And if anything, the colors are making it more difficult to see what's going on. So yeah, just use a table here. And here's another one that might be controversial, but this goes back to that Netflix plot that I showed you earlier. Although that was terrible in multiple ways. Um, and this isn't as bad, it's fine, but really, the plot isn't communicating any more information than the table is already communicating. So visuals shine when they can give you information that a table can't communicate. But in this situation, the table does just fine communicating the information. So really, the plot isn't all that necessary. Now for this specific plot, I really like it doesn't anger me <laughs> like other plots do. Um, it's just unnecessary. There, I said it. All right, rule number three. And if you have followed me long enough, you knew I was going to say this. Because basically, in just about every paper I've written, I have said the exact same thing. And that is that when you plot, you must communicate the fit of the model as well as the misfit. So the best way to ensure our plots earn space in our papers is to make sure they reveal how well it fits the data as well as to reveal where it doesn't fit the data. And so the best way to do that is to always plot raw data, like in this plot and to always overlay the fit of the model. And if you followed my logistic regression plotting series, you will know that I used those two criteria to develop my new logistic plots. And they worked out pretty well, I must say. Kind of a game changer when it comes to logistic plotting. So just to summarize, yeah, when you are writing a paper, your whole point is to convince your audience that your conclusions have merit. And because the visual pattern recognition system in humans is like super complex and super sensitive, we tend to gravitate toward looking at plots first. And so knowing that your audience is going to focus in on the plots, it's probably a good idea to make sure your plots communicate the model that you chose. So make sure to use plots that support your conclusion. And if your message is about the shape, like curvature or parallel lines or interactions or clusters or whatever, then definitely use a plot. But if you're trying to talk about very specific values, use a table or text. And then finally, when you communicate these things, use a model plot that shows both the fit and the misfit. And usually that means you do some sort of scatter plot variety where each dot represents the raw data. And then you got some other symbol or line communicating how the model fits the data. And that way your audience can immediately look at it and know exactly how well your model fits the data. So yeah, that's all I got. So let me know what you think. Do you agree with this or would you add more? Um, I'm interested to hear what you say. And as always, if you want to take a class with me, go to simplistics.net. I will leave a link in the description for the next live class that I teach. Or you know what? Sometimes these um, self-guided classes don't get enough love. So I'm just going to give some love to the self-guided classes, man. We've even got a visualization class. So I'm going to leave a link in the description to that. If you want to do some visualization learning and stuff and of course you can always do consulting hours with me which i will leave links for that in the description and yeah hope you enjoyed yourself talk to you next time peace out
Yes. Ah, statistician. Please remove your results of anything I don't understand, please. Hmm. It's a hot mess out there. Well, I can hardly see you. Are y'all there? Y'all watching? Make yourself known to me. Make yourself known to me. Maths? Why is it that some countries, maybe all of them but the US, say maths instead of math? Like, I study math, but if I go across the ocean, I study maths. Two different subjects, apparently. Hey, it doesn't make sense that math has an S at the end of it. And they said, what about stats? Oh yeah, so I guess you are more consistent than me. What? What? Have you heard news that I haven't heard that there are things amiss and afloat and adrift? I don't know what a resource is, but I know what a resource is. Woo! You know, some people complain about how I teach and said, hey, if you stop trying to make jokes and focused on the content, um, that's the way that I prefer. So that's the way you should do it. Well, that's news to me that my entire YouTube channel is dedicated to your individual learning. Forget whatever else says and forget what I want to do. No, I'm not your slave. I will not cater to your whims. That's the existential question, isn't it? What do you do when your model is bad? You debadify it. Dagnabbit, and I'm bold to say it that that's the only solution. You debadify it.